In a picture, a thousand stories are waiting to be discovered. Each photo has its tail, taking us back in time and making us feel different emotions. So, what better way to gain invaluable insight into the history of Native Americans other than pictures? This series continues our previous exploration of captivating images of the Plains and Rocky Mountain photographers showcasing Arapaho, Cheyenne, Chippewa, Ottawa, Pawnee, Sioux, and Ute men and women. You'll find the link to the previous episode in the description below. Moving on to this episode, brought to you by Native Journals, we will uncover incredible photos that offer a glimpse into the lives, cultures, and traditions of Native American communities. You will witness moments frozen in time, each frame narrating a story of survival, adaptation, and the enduring spirit of Native American civilizations. Before we unveil some pixels, kindly like this video and hit the subscribe button for exclusive access to enlightening videos on the history of Native American tribes. Our first rare picture is an image of a Jicarilla girl. You will immediately notice something unique about this picture. Apart from the wide-eyed, innocent-looking girl who looks unsure of what is happening, you will see her special attire which comprises a fantastic collection of beaded necklaces and a patterned cape. It is the well-known traditional feast dress worn by young Jicarilla women to signify their entry into womanhood. The Jicarilla Apache feast dress is a carefully crafted garment, traditionally made from materials like buckskin or wool. The design often incorporates vibrant colors, with intricate beadwork covering the entire dress. The beadwork features geometric patterns, symbols, and representations of nature, reflecting the spiritual and cultural significance of the Jicarilla Apache people. The cape worn by the Jicarilla girl is adorned with symbolic lunar patterns that connect to the moon's phases. These lunar patterns likely carry dual symbolism, representing not only the celestial cycles of the moon, but also a woman's menstrual cycle. Our next rare picture is that of the Hashibad. In Navajo culture, religious practices and ceremonies play a significant role, and various rituals often use masks. These masks can represent spiritual beings, ancestors, or deities, and are employed in ceremonies to promote community healing, balance, and harmony. The mask worn in the image above is the mask of Hashabad, which signifies a benevolent female goddess. It was believed that the goddess's power would radiate through the one who wears the mask and blesses everyone around him, including the sick. Next is an astonishing photo of Chief Kwana Parker credited to H.P. Robinson. Kwana Parker was born around the year 1845 in the Wichita Mountains, now in Oklahoma during intense conflict between Native American tribes and European settlers. His mother was Cynthia Ann Parker, a white captive whom the Comanches had taken during a raid. His father was Chief Peta Nokona, a respected Comanche leader. Kwana grew up immersed in the Comanche way of life, learning their customs, language, and survival skills. Kwana Parker rose to prominence as the primary leader of the entire Comanche nation, unprecedented in their history. Over the following 30 years, he served as the primary intermediary between his people and the encroaching white civilization. Kwana actively promoted education and agricultural practices, championed the rights of the Comanche, and achieved success as a prosperous entrepreneur. His efforts to bridge the gap between Native American and European American ways of life contributed to the survival of the Comanche people during a difficult period. The following image, taken in 1923 by Edward Curtis, depicts a Hoopa woman carrying her baby in a traditional baby carrier. This baby carrier is not what you see every day. However, it was designed to provide maximum comfort to Native American babies, Generally, Native American baby carriers, better known as cradle boards, typically have a sturdy, flat backboard as the main support structure. This backboard is often made from wood, such as willow, oak, or cedar, 
providing a firm foundation for the carrier. These ties are also adjustable to accommodate the baby's growth. In addition, wide, adjustable straps are attached to the backboard. These straps are used to wrap the baby, limiting free movement of the arms and legs. This is done simply to give the baby a similar feeling of being held. Here is a rare photo of Buffalo Bill posing with Sitting Bull. This is undoubtedly an iconic photo symbolizing the complex and often contradictory relationships between Native Americans and figures from Euro-American society during the late 19th century. The photograph, in particular, captures a moment when Sitting Bull and Buffalo Bill came together for a performance or promotional event. There are two interpretations of this image. On one hand, it portrays two iconic figures from different cultural backgrounds, momentarily united for entertainment. On the other hand, it symbolizes the impact of westward expansion on Native American communities. We also have a rare photo of Zitkala Sa, a Sioux woman from 1898. Zitkala Shah, also known as Gertrude Simmons Bonin, was a prominent Yankton, Dakota Sioux writer, musician, and Native American rights advocate during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Her life and work contributed significantly to the understanding and preservation of Native American culture. At the tender age of eight, she was sent to White's Manual Labor Institute, a missionary boarding school, where she experienced cultural assimilation and separation from her family. This experience greatly influenced her later advocacy for Native American rights and education. In 1900, she achieved an outstanding feat by co-writing and performing in the first Native American opera, the Sun Dance Opera, which blended traditional Native music with Western classical forms. Zitkala Shah's legacy endures through her literary contributions, music, and advocacy for Native American rights, marking her as a critical figure in the early 20th century Native American Renaissance. Here is a timeless image of an Arikara warrior named Bear's Belly. Bear's Belly belonged to the Arikara tribe, which is historically associated with the Great Plains region. The photograph highlights Bear's Belly's status as one of the most esteemed fighters within his tribe. His name, derived from a battle where he reportedly killed three bears, suggests a connection to the symbolic power and strength associated with bears in Native American cultures. The Arikara people are part of the more prominent Kadoan linguistic family and have a rich history in the Plains region. Their traditional territory covered present-day North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. Like many Plains tribes, the Arikara had a strong warrior tradition, and individuals like Bear's Belly, who demonstrated exceptional bravery and skill in battles, were highly respected within the community. Next is a rare picture of Black Shawl, dated 1888. At first sight, you will agree that she gives off an aura of prestige. The Black Shawl is well known as the wife of Crazy Horse, a highly respected Lakota Sioux leader. Unfortunately, historical documents and details about this woman are pretty limited. But we do know that Crazy Horse was an enigmatic warrior and leader who played a significant role in the resistance against the encroachment of white settlers onto Native American lands. He is best known for his involvement in battles like the Battle of Little Bighorn. The couple had a daughter whom they named They Are Afraid of Her. Sadly, their joy was cut short as she died around the age of two, likely due to cholera. Around the 1920s, a black shawl sadly lost her life during the influenza outbreak. Whiteman runs him, a warrior in the Little Bighorn. This notable warrior, also known as Brave Eagle, posed for this picture in the tier 1910. White Man Runs Him played a role in the historic Battle of the Little Bighorn in June 1876. This battle, also known as Custer's Last Stand, 
was a response to the U.S. government's efforts to force Native American tribes onto reservations. Whiteman runs him, along with other prominent leaders such as Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, fought against Custer's 7th Cavalry. During the battle, a coalition of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors effectively countered Custer's forces, resulting in a devastating defeat for the U.S. Army. White Man Runs Him's bravery and tactical skills, along with the collective efforts of Native American warriors, played a significant role in the battle's outcome. Next is another rare photo of the United States officials sitting among Native chiefs, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, dated 1891. The photograph captures a significant moment in the complex history of Native American and U.S. government relations. Undoubtedly, it holds profound historical importance as it documents a pivotal meeting between United States officials and leaders from several Native American tribes. In the photograph's foreground, United States officials sit alongside Native chiefs. The tribes represented in this gathering include the Oglala Lakota, Miniconju, and the Brule. Such intertribal meetings were crucial forums for dialogue and negotiation during a time marked by profound changes in the lives of Native American communities. This particular assembly likely addressed matters of considerable consequence, ranging from land rights and resource allocation to issues of governance and sovereignty. At the core of these discussions was the ongoing struggle for the preservation of Native American cultures and ways of life amidst the relentless push for westward expansion by the United States. Here is also a rare image of General Custer's six Crow Scouts standing by the graves on the Little Bighorn Battlefield, 1908. This image evokes a powerful reflection on the historical significance of the Battle of the Little Bighorn a pivotal and tragic event that unfolded on June 25, 1876. General George Armstrong Custer led the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry in an ill-fated campaign against the combined forces of the Lakota Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes. The battle resulted in a devastating defeat for Custer's forces and marked a turning point in the conflicts between the U.S. government and Native American tribes. The presence of the six Crow Scouts in the photograph makes it even more enjoyable. The Crow Tribe, traditional enemies of the Lakota Sioux, chose to align with the U.S. Army during the Indian Wars. The Scouts served as valuable interpreters of the terrain and enemy movements for Custer. In 1908, decades after the battle, the Crow Scouts returned to the site standing by the graves that marked the final resting places of those who fought in the conflict. Next is a photo of Black Eagle, an Oglala Lakota medicine man, dated 1932. Lakota medicine men play a crucial role in the Lakota people's spiritual, cultural, and healing practices, who are part of the larger Sioux Nation. These individuals are often referred to as Wikasa Wakan, or Heyoka Wikasa, meaning holy man or medicine man in the Lakota language. They are known as spiritual leaders who connect with the unseen world. They facilitate communication with the spirit realm, seeking guidance and wisdom to address the community's needs. Their role involves interpreting dreams, performing rituals, and maintaining a deep connection with the sacred. More importantly, these medicine men were reverenced for their ability to heal physical and spiritual ailments. They employ a combination of herbal remedies, prayer, and ceremonial practices to bring balance and harmony to individuals and the community. Healing ceremonies often involve using sacred objects like pipes and eagle feathers. Vision quests were also integral to a medicine man's training and spiritual development. These quests involve time alone in nature, fasting, and seeking visions that provide insight into one's purpose, spiritual path, and connection with the divine. Here is a group of Navajo Native American students when they first joined the school and a comparison photo of them years later. In 1882, 
a group of young Navajo lads embarked on a journey that marked a significant life shift. At the time, the U.S. government implemented policies aimed at assimilating Native American children into mainstream American culture through boarding schools. In the first image, you can't miss the expressions on their faces, which reveal a mix of uncertainty and curiosity about the unfamiliar environment they are entering. The comparison photo taken years later serves as a visual testament to the influence of assimilation policies on the lives of these Navajo students. The changes in clothing, hairstyles, and overall appearance reflect the impact of Western cultural norms imposed upon them during their time in the boarding school. The last image on our list is an alluring photo of the famous Hopi potter, Nampeyo. Nampeyo was a renowned Hopi Tewa potter, widely celebrated for her exceptional skill and innovative contributions to Native American pottery. This talented woman was pivotal in reviving the Sikyatki pottery style, characterized by its thin-walled vessels, intricate designs, and muted color palette. Nampeyo's innovations included incorporating ancient designs, such as migration patterns and symbolic bird motifs, into her pottery. She was known for experimenting with various shapes, sizes, and pottery techniques, showcasing her technical skills and artistic creativity. By the late 19th century, Nampeyo gained recognition for her exceptional pottery, attracting the attention of collectors and anthropologists. Her work was displayed at various exhibitions, including the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition, that brings us to the end of this episode day. If you've enjoyed the pixels we've shared so far, kindly share your thoughts in the comments section below. Also, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you're yet to do so. Thanks for your unwavering support. See you in our next video.